tonight, Chris DeRose is gonna be speaking on his book, The President's War. Uh, the American Civil War was the first time that the US had five living former presidents. And Chris is going to discuss how the actions and interactions of Lincoln's predecessors contributed to the coming of the Civil War and how they dealt with President Lincoln during the war. Um, I thought I knew a lot about this period and those presidents, uh, but I recently read Chris's book and I learned a lot more. Uh, Chris is a New York Times bestselling author and his latest book is The Fighting Bunch, The Battle of Athens and how World War II veterans won the only successful armed rebellion since the revolution. So it's something you wanna make sure you read. Uh, Chris is an Arizona guy. Uh, he was former, formerly civil senior litigation counsel to the Arizona Attorney General. He's a professor of constitutional law and clerk of the Superior Court for Maricopa County. And he also serves on the board of directors for the Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln in Association. So Chris, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's so great to be back with you guys. You know, when, when Mark and I were first planning out this talk, we were hoping against hope that uh, we would be able to do it in person. And I think we were first discussing this maybe all the way back in November. And so it wasn't, wasn't clear what would happen. You know, I think we all have a, a lot of reasons to be uh, glad for the arrival of the vaccines and how widely distributed they've been and uh, so many people who are able to get them every day. And so it's a, a matter of just a matter of time before we're all meeting again in person. But regrettably, um, I'm, I'm with you guys from home. And so I hope you guys will have me back sometime to talk uh, when we can be back in person. So anyway, I'm very glad to be back with you guys. And I look forward to your questions. This is such uh, an incredibly engaged group um, and such a, a well-read group. Um, and it's always a pleasure uh, to be here with you guys and to, to take your questions and to talk about an area of the Civil War uh, that really uh, never has gotten the treatment it deserved. You know, um, the Civil War is a subject in, in American history with uh, absolutely limitless things uh, to write about down to specific battles and personages and events uh, of our great conflict. And um, I really felt very privileged as an author and as a historian to be able to, to be the first one to write about this unique Civil War phenomenon. And it all started when I was visiting a friend uh, in Seattle and he was talking to me about Martin Van Buren and the Civil War. And if you think about Martin Van Buren and you think about the Civil War, those are two things you never think about in the same sentence at the same time. I said, wait a minute, that guy's still around when the Civil War breaks out. My friend said, oh yeah, no, there were quite a few of them. And sure enough, it's a unique phenomenon in American history. It was the first time that five former presidents were alive at, at once. And so I thought to myself, boy, they must have had really strong feelings about what was happening in the country, watching this country that they had presided over uh, tear itself apart and, and go to war with itself. And in each, you know, in each way, each of these presidents had tried to prevent the Civil War and each in their own way had caused it, had brought it about. And I wondered what happened when uh, the shells started falling on Fort Sumter, what these former chief magistrates of the United States had done, how they'd reacted. By the way, can I just say how exciting this is? You know, you guys had started this off by talking about the opportunities presented by meeting over Zoom. And I just want to welcome our guests from South America. We've got uh, one from Venezuela and another from Brazil. Uh, what a testament uh, to the worldwide interest of this subject, our civil war here in the United States. By the way, our friend who just joined from Brazil, uh, I don't know if you know this, but um, someday I wanna go to Brazil and visit uh, a community called Americana, which, is, which was settled by uh, people known as the Confederados. And so these were um, former Confederate prominent plantation owners in the South who had moved to Brazil after their defeat in the civil war to try to recreate the antebellum South in Brazil. And so their ancestors are still there to this day. You can visit a Confederate cemetery uh, and you can visit a community where um, Confederate celebrations and traditions are still uh, kept alive in a place called uh, Americana. And so it's an area of great interest to me and one I hope to visit someday. So welcome Antonio from Brazil. I wonder if you've been to Americana, maybe we can talk about it at the end. Um, 
So I, I'm, I've decided, you know, instantly when I learned about this phenomenon of these five former presidents alive at the time of the Civil War, uh, that this was going to be the subject for my next book. At this point, I'd written a book called Founding Rivals about James Madison and James Monroe and their friendship and rivalry at the time of the founding. I had written a book called Congressman Lincoln. Um, and, you know, Abraham Lincoln has 16,000 books written about his life. And you never expect to be able to write something original or new about Abraham Lincoln. But sure enough, there was an opportunity to write the first really authoritative uh, look at his time as a member of Congress. And of course, Lincoln only has three jobs in politics and only has one job in the federal government before he becomes president in, um, in, in March of 1861. And uh, that is as a member of Congress for two years during the presidency of James K. Polk. And so I thought it was really interesting to, to look at and visit that, that section of his life. And so I was looking around for an idea for a third book and I decided to write about these former presidents. And so, um, you know, where do you start? Where do you start a project like this? You're trying to cover the entire, you're trying to the entire sweep of the antebellum era through the vantage points of five presidents and then you get to the Civil War. And so where do you start something like this? I started it at a dinner in the administration of President Andrew Jackson, where you had the first real, um, first real, I think, test of secession, a uh, first president to really be tested by the idea of states threatening to break away, states refusing to accept federal authority. Um, and um, so things are really tense and there's a dinner and there's a very, there's a lot, there's a protocol to these dinners and um, the president was called upon to give a toast. And he said, the union, it must be preserved. And this was, it felt like an exploded bomb in the words of one observer uh, in the room because the dinner had been hijacked by so-called nullifiers, proponents of the idea that states could disregard laws that they felt were unjust or unconstitutional. And everyone expected the president uh, as a Southerner, as a slave owner, uh, to side with the sentiments of South Carolina uh, and that region. Uh, Andrew Jackson uh, was a Southerner, but he was certainly a Unionist first. And at this dinner, he declared that uh, um, in his uh, typical characteristic straightforward manner. Next in the order of precedent to speak is John C. Calhoun, the leading exponent of nullification, his vice president. Um, from the state of South Carolina. And he says, the union next to our liberties most dear. Um, third is uh, Martin Van Buren, who's the secretary of state. And he says, uh, to the union, let us remember that um, its creation and its preservation was founded and fostered by compromise, by the spirit of compromise. Uh, indeed, at that point in American history, you have not only the compromises that went into the US constitution, uh, but you have uh, the Missouri Compromise. Um, and so you have um, a country that was built and sustained by compromises and Van Buren trying to remind everybody of that. So those three points of view broadly characterize uh, the three camps in America in this antebellum era. And of course, these are going to vie with each other for supremacy. And ultimately, of course, Jackson's point of view will, will win out that the union is paramount first and foremost not subject to the South's peculiar version of liberty or, or, any, um, you know, or, any, or any sort of compromise. Um, so of course, Martin Van Buren uh, will become the first, um, well, Martin Van Buren will, will secede uh, his former boss, uh, Andrew Jackson in the presidency. And he goes down in America's first financial crisis. Um, stop me if you've heard this one before, but, um, Cheap money overheated the real estate market, causing the collapse of Wall Street firms and um, a rash of foreclosures and bankruptcies. Uh, of course, we've learned from that and have never repeated the mistakes of that great financial crisis. And uh, Van Buren's uh, presidency will, will be limited uh, to one term. Uh, replaced by the great war hero, William Henry Harrison, uh, our shortest tenured president in office. Um, Harrison's uh, untimely death paves the way for John Tyler to become president of the United States. Uh, Tyler was a Virginian, uh, son of a very prominent uh, Virginia family, prominent early American family. And, you know, Tyler's view of the United States really was that it was kind of, um, the federal government was kind of like the United Nations. 
that um, really the national government was a place where the states could get together and talk and maybe cooperate on limited areas of mutual interest, but um, not never really saw America as one country, really more like a collection of these states and the federal government is kind of where you go to, to work out any differences uh, that might arise. And so he's really going to be, be serving James K. Polk's uh, second term in many ways. Uh, you know, we think about, we, we most closely identify the acquisition of Mexico um, with James K. Polk and rightly so, but it's uh, annexation uh, really is, is perfected in the administration of John Tyler. And uh, the acquisition of Texas will um, set America on a course, collision course with Mexico. And so as a consequence of that war, we have this uh, broad new swath of territory in the United States, we're a Pacific power now. And um, anytime the U US acquires new land in the Santabellum era, we acquire more problems with it because the question becomes, whether the land is going to be free or whether it's going to be slave or some combination of the two. And in, by the way, including the land where most of us are speaking from, where I'm speaking to you from right now, land that was acquired as a result of the, the Mexican-American War. Um, and so, um, so Tyler will leave the presidency uh, after one term um, in, um, and he's replaced by you know rare victory for the Whig the Whig the, the Whig the Whig Party. Um, you'll have uh, you know the Whig Party wins wins two presidential elections, both with war heroes, and uh, you know there was a real question on what Zachary Taylor really believed, but the Whig Party saw a, a, a winner uh, in him, and um, you know like Abraham Lincoln said, Abraham Lincoln is a very principled man, but he said you know we've tried losing long enough, let's 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 try winning as a, as a philosophy. Um, of course, uh, both Whig presidents, both war heroes, both die in office. Um, and so you have um, Millard Fillmore, who had 18 months earlier had been comptroller of the state of New York, former longtime congressman, uh, becomes president of the United States over a country that's, that's pulling itself apart over what to do um, over, over this, this, this new territory. Um, in the West, uh, there are just a number of issues piling up. So you had what to do with the Mexican session. You also had Texas claiming part of the New Mexico territory for itself. Uh, you had a number of Northern states that had adopted what were called personal liberty laws to help residents of those states resist uh, slave catchers who were pursuing uh, fugitive slaves uh, up in the North. So uh, states like Vermont, Massachusetts, New Hampshire refusing to let any part of their resources, their sheriffs, their police, their jails, their courts be used uh, to send fugitive slaves uh, back to the South. And so um, you have all these sectional issues piling up and uh, it's gonna cul culminate in the Compromise of 1850. Um, and really it's, it's properly understood as the Compromises of 1850 because what you had is an extreme faction on one side and an extreme faction on the other side and in the middle, you had a group of centrist members of Congress who voted for every measure, right? So California comes in as a free state. Texas is, uh, has to settle for its own territory, but their debts are paid off. The slave trade is ended in the District of Columbia, but the practice of owning slaves there will remain legal so long as Maryland per permits the, the ownership of slaves. And so it's a long list of compromises. But really the hardest pill for the North to swallow is an enhanced fugitive slave law. And Millard Fillmore, who today uh, something of a punchline and synonymous with uh, the idea of uh, an anonymous little known president, actually a man I greatly admire. And uh, I think a very great president and one without whom uh, the United States of America looks very different. Millard Fillmore signs the fugitive slave law despite the fact that it had gone, it had gone against his, his personal opposition to slavery. Um, he, he knew it was necessary to prevent uh, a civil war from occurring in, in 1850. And, um, and then mi he militarily confronts South Carolina and Texas over uh, the remaining agitation over the parts of the compromises of 1850 that they didn't like. And so he, he will pass on to his successor, uh, Franklin Pierce, 
uh, a country where a lot of the major issues have been settled and resolved, um, you know, a very prosperous country. And so Franklin Pierce has a really great starting hand that he inherits from Millard Fillmore, with whom he had uh, served as a freshman in the US House of Representatives uh, years before. Uh, Franklin Pierce, of course, is very quickly going to, to rip uh, the bandage off of um, the country's wounds by repealing the Missouri Compromise, right? We have the Missouri Compromise that said in, in all new, uh, in, from the Louisiana Purchase, all territory above a certain line is going to be free. All, all territory below a certain line is going to be uh, slave territory. Kansas, of course, rests comfortably uh, above that Missouri Compromise line. Uh, but Franklin Pierce, despite being from New Hampshire, is, uh, uh, is um, a, a very reliable ally for the South, for Southern politicians, for slavery as an institution. He really just does not understand um, Northern opposition to slavery, opposition to slavery in general. Um, so he, he, he signs the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which is going to set America on a, on a collision course for civil war. And so by allowing the Kansas territory to be, um, to be the subject of, of, of a potential future slave state, and so really what gets codified here is the brainchild of Stephen Douglas of Illinois. He said, wait, there's another way. Instead of deciding for these states, these territories, whether they're going to be free or slave, why don't we just have a vote on it? Um, and so there's, you know, there's a concept called popular sovereignty. And uh, maybe if popular sovereignty had been permitted to work, we could have avoided a civil war, or at least the civil war that begins in 1860 and 1861. Um, but something else happens instead. So when it comes time for Kansans to vote on slavery, um, there, there's, there's no interest really among the vast majority of the population. Kansas is, the Kansas territory is being settled by people from the North. It is getting settled uh, by, um, by men who don't wanna compete with free labor for their own services. Um, and so there's just not really much of a constituency to make Kansas a, a slave state. But the Kansas elections are hijacked uh, through violence by men uh, from Missouri and elsewhere and uh, through force and fraud at the ballot box to an almost uh, comical degree. I mean, they're really not being very subtle about the lengths they're going to to steal this election. Um, you know, you might have 2000 votes in favor of the pro-slavery candidate for office in a district with, where five people live. I mean, they're not, the, the people stealing these elections in Kansas do not feel uh, any, any, um, any need to be uh, discreet about what they're doing. And uh, they receive the full backing of the Pierce White House. President Pierce really has an opportunity here to send in federal troops to enforce fair and free elections in the Kansas territory. Kansas will vote to remain a free state. And um, really all would be well in the United States. Of course, that's not what happens. So Pierce countenance is unprecedented election fraud uh, in Kansas. Uh, Kansas becomes uh, for all intents and purposes, a, a territory that is controlled uh, by a pro-slavery element. Um, and, and, and it leads to violence, right? Violence is the inevitable outcome of um, people unable to participate meaningfully in politics, in free elections and fair elections. And that's what happened in Kansas, right? The, the anti-slavery faction knew that they were the most numerous body, but they also knew that they had no meaningful chance to participate in keeping their territory free of slavery. Um, and of course, that's where you'll have John Brown uh, radicalized. And really, I think in many ways where the civil war begins on the prairies of Kansas uh, between those factions. Um, and this will help kill the Democratic Party in the North. One of the precursors for civil war is that you'd have sectional political parties. Right up to this point, you have Northern and Southern Whigs, you have Northern and Southern Democrats arrayed around issues other than slavery. Uh, but the can repeal of the Kansas, uh, the Kansas Nebraska Act and the repeal of the Missouri Compromise really will, will kill the Democratic Party in the North, uh, much as Millard Fillmore's signature on the enhanced fugitive slave law killed the Whig party um, and his, and his, and his, you know, killed the, killed the, killed the Whig party pretty much 
um, in, in both parts of the country, signing a series of un, uh, compromises that were unpopular in, in both sections. Um, and it will help create the birth of, uh, gives birth to the Republican party. Really the Kansas Nebraska act is the midwife of the Republican party. Now you have uh, former Whigs, you have uh, former Northern uh, Democrats, uh, people who are members of the free soil party, uh, which was a, a, a strident anti-slavery party who had actually nominated uh, Martin Van Buren as their candidate for president in 1848. Um, forming this new Republican party. So now you have a Republican party in the South, the, the Democrat or Republican party in the North, whereas the, the, the Democrats will become the dominant party in the South, Republicans non-existent in that part of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, Pierce is, is gonna be a one-time candidate. Pierce is actually still the only elected president to be denied uh, renomination by his own party for a second term. That's never happened before and never happened since. And, uh, you know, so Pierce would come in as the youngest president to that point at 48 years of age, is out of a job at 52. Democrats looking around, hoping to remain in office. So, okay, we need to find someone who is completely untainted by this Kansas Nebraska act. Well, uh, you know, when Pierce got into office, he looked around in the party and said, who could present a uh, credible rival to me for renomination and decided that James Buchanan was high on that list and sent Buchanan very much against his will uh, to the United Kingdom uh, as the minister to the court of St. James is. Um, but it, it backfires in the sense that James Buchanan is, is, is kept completely free of the taint of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He's in the United Kingdom. He has nothing to do with what's going on in Kansas. Uh, and in fact, um, because this is a civil war audience, uh, it may be of interest to note that uh, James Buchanan took with him to the United Kingdom uh, a talented young New York politician as his equivalent of his chief of staff, a man uh, familiar to all of you by the name of Daniel Sickles. Um, so James Buchanan becomes uh, the target of a draft for president. And uh, this time it'll be successful. James Buchanan who'd been talked about as a potential presidential candidate uh, going back all the way to 1844, maybe earlier, is now got uh, the job he's always wanted. He's president of the United States. And so, um, you know, while the, the public rightly blamed the Democratic Party for the problems in the country, for the, what was happening in, in the Kansas Territory, they knew that to elect John C. Fremont in this new Republican Party, right, running on a platform that's totally opposed to any expansion of slavery would trigger a civil war in 1856. And so the country says, we'll elect Buchanan as a placeholder. Um, but Buchanan's inability to manage this job that he had wanted his entire life uh, is going to keep, the, keep, keep, keep our foot on the gas metaphorically as a country headed toward this cliff uh, in the election of Abraham Lincoln. So the first thing that James Buchanan does is he actually lobbies the Supreme Court, obviously a very unusual um, unusual move, certainly would not be well received today if a president tried to interfere in a Supreme Court decision. But uh, James Buchanan encourages his allies on the US Supreme Court to draft a broad decision in the Dred Scott case uh, to take as, as, as extreme a position as possible because Buchanan thought that this would um, pacify the country when of course it has the exact opposite effect, right? Of declaring that, um, that, that, that the black man has no rights that white men are bound to respect. Um, really incredibly polarizing case. One of the few cases that probably most Americans can name and tell you, and tell you what happened. It's a case that, um, you know, go down in, in, in Supreme Court infamy and contribute. I mean, if you think about all of the different permutations, right? From the Republicans who say no expansion of slavery to popular sovereignty somewhere in the middle uh, to the idea of, you know, drawing some sort of line across the country. to the most extreme position, which is basically that slavery is allowed anywhere in the territories that, that there, or, or even into free states uh, in the North. The Supreme Court placed itself firmly in the most extreme camp. Um, so those fires are gonna keep continuing. Uh, fraud and violence are gonna to continue to rule the day in Kansas. Um, 
with more stolen elections and uh, James Buchanan is uh, similarly disinterested in doing anything to try to secure free and fair elections in Kansas. Uh, you know, Buchanan is rightly remembered as uh, one of our worst presidents, but generally not for the things he's actually responsible for. We usually think of him as among our worst presidents because of his response to the secession crisis. I actually think his response to the secession crisis was pretty good. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Really to me, uh, Buchanan's great crime is the Lecompton Constitution and trying to force the Lecompton Constitution on, on, on Kansas. So every state uh, in preparation, every territory in preparation to become a state adopts its own constitution. And in this case, this Lecompton Constitution was clearly the product of a fraudulent uh, election and um, series of fraudulent elections and uh, would have enshrined slavery in, in, in uh, the new state of Kansas. And uh, Buchanan tried to force that constitution, that application for statehood through Congress and leveraged everything he could as president of the United States, patronage, sympathetic newspaper editors. Um, enter Stephen Douglas. Uh, Stephen Douglas, who's the champion of popular sovereignty, author of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, says, you've made a mockery of my idea of popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty relies on uh, citizens to work these problems out through elections. And so you've made a mockery of this by uh, tacitly supporting uh, these unfair elections in Kansas. And uh, so Stephen Douglas throws everything he can into the fight against admitting Kansas with the Lecompton Constitution. Uh, Buchanan summons him to the White House and tries to remind him of some of the fates suffered uh, by people who challenged previous Democratic presidents. He cites a specific example with President Jackson. Stephen Douglas tells uh, James Buchanan, um, let me remind you that uh, President Jackson is dead. You know, in other words, you're no President Jackson. Um, and so Stephen Douglas uh, succeeds in uh, killing the application of Kansas uh, to become a state with the pro-slavery Lecompton Constitution. This, of course, will really signal the death knell for the Democratic Party. A Democratic Party had always required two thirds of the vote to be nominated. This effectively gave Southern states a veto over the identity of the Democratic nominee. Uh, Democrats who were the most successful political party uh, in this era uh, up to the Civil War typically succeeded in electing the president. That means that Southerners had a veto over who became president for most of this era. Uh, this is why uh, we have so many dark horse candidates for president, because if you're, you know, the, the, the higher profile you are, the more enemies you, you're likely to have, the harder it is for you to get two thirds. So that's why you ended up with dark horse candidates like James Polk or Franklin Pierce uh, ascending to the White House. So Stephen Douglas very clearly has uh, the majority of the support of the Democratic Party, but there's no way he's getting two thirds, not after what he did. Uh, in, in, in defeating the admission of pro-slavery Kansas. And um, there's a walkout at the Democratic Convention. The Southern delegates walk out, nominate Breckinridge as the nominee of the Southern Democratic Party. So you have Stephen Douglas for the Northern Democrats, Breckinridge for the Southern Democrats. You have Abraham Lincoln, the compromise uh, nominee, a one-term, former one-term member of Congress. Uh, most famous for losing the 1858 Senate race in Illinois uh, to Stephen Douglas, the surprise nominee of the Republican Party. And, um, you know, Lincoln, um, you know, the, by this time, the, the, the population had caught up with the South and uh, the North had put so much distance between them uh, in terms of how many electoral votes they had uh, that, that Lincoln wins fairly comfortably for president which will start a drumbeat of Southern states seceding. And this is where things get really interesting because when Lincoln comes into office, he's got these five former presidents running around. And it used to be a convention that former presidents stayed clear out of politics. In fact, it was so closely adhered to that, uh, that former presidents weren't even supposed to step foot in Washington, DC. Because if you think about what's on the mind of um, America's leadership at this time, um, you know, they've all studied 
uh, the death of the Roman Republic. They know how republics and representative governments end. And so the idea that a, a, you know someone who's a former president just needs to steer clear of Washington DC in general uh, to avoid any, um, any even appearance that he might be trying to take his office back somehow. Um, so this is all gonna change. All bets are off uh, when the civil war begins and all these presidents are coming back into politics in a big way. Uh, Lincoln actually stops and meets with Millard Fillmore uh, when he stops in Buffalo on his way to the White House to be sworn in as president. Um, James Buchanan confronting a really unique situation in American history. You know, people uh, always talk about, well, why didn't James Buchanan confront, confront the secession movement militarily more aggressively sooner? It's actually really easy. Um, James Buchanan had a standing army of about 18,000 men under his command, um, at least two thirds of whom were west of the Mississippi, some of whom were we are now protecting settlers on the frontier. But let's say Buchanan had all 18,000 under his command and they were all in Washington, DC. That's actually not enough to successfully invade South Carolina. Um, and it certainly wouldn't be enough uh, to defeat um, other Southerners who would come to the aid uh, of South Carolina. So from Buchanan's perspective, this can be worked out politically. And that's not a bad perspective to have because if you think about it, even when, when things look really dire for the United States, we could always compromise our way out of things. And so if that's the, the compromises of the Constitutional Convention, compromise of 1820, compromises of 1850, we'd always found a way to work out our differences through the political system. So Buchanan is still very optimistic with some reason that things can be worked out that way. So he doesn't have the troops under his command, even if he wants to fight them. Um, and he knows that things will get an awful lot worse if he starts off with a military approach because you still have the border states to play for. Um, not just Kentucky famously, which Abraham Lincoln said, uh, you know, I need, I'd like to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. Um, no, I mean, there were border states to play for like Virginia and North Carolina uh, that were late to the whole secession game. Um, and so Buchanan turns over a capital that is uh, very secure to Abraham Lincoln. He says he brings in all these troops that are ostensibly part of the inaugural festivities, but they're really there uh, in order to make sure that the capital is safe when Abraham Lincoln enters. And so he ensures a, a peaceful transition of power. And then when Buchanan leaves office, he writes the first presidential memoir. And he thinks to himself that Abraham Lincoln is following my course that I've set out for him so closely that Lincoln's victory will be my redemption. And of course, we know better than that, that that's not true. Um, Martin Van Buren, who's not doing well um, when the Civil War breaks out, uh, makes sure to write letters um, that make their way out into the public, encouraging young men to respond to Abraham Lincoln's call for troops after Fort Sumter. Um, Millard uh, Fillmore does the same. Uh, he gives uh, public addresses, encouraging young men to respond to President Lincoln's call for troops. Millard Fillmore, and there are pictures you can find of him, uh, old and a little overweight in military uniform because he raises a National Guard unit of his own, of men who were either too old or too infirm to serve on the front lines. Uh, and you think about, well, wow, Buffalo is a strange place to raise the National Guard unit. But actually at this point in history, Canada is part of the United Kingdom. Uh, United Kingdom, of course, comes very close at various points throughout the war <coughs> to joining uh, in the Confederate side. So Buffalo very quickly could have gone from um, a distant outpost in the Civil War to um, being on the very front lines uh, if, if the United Kingdom had joined. Um, and Millard Fillmore also will take uh, over the helm of uh, the largest philanthropic organization in the country to that point that will be dedicated to provide for the care of widows and orphans and injured uh, veterans of the Civil War. <clears throat> so you've got Van Buren and Fillmore and Buchanan uh, supporting Abraham Lincoln in his decision uh, to raise troops after the firing on Fort Sumter. Uh, John Tyler who had uh, played an interesting role in the run up to Fort Sumter. He really was a, a running as a diplomat between the leadership of South Carolina and the, the, the Buchanan White House. Um, and in the, the winter, 
uh, before Abraham Lincoln's inauguration, he would lead something called uh, the Old Gentleman's Convention, which was held at the Willard's Hotel. And it was just a gathering of uh, prominent former elected officials and citizens from throughout the United States saying, hey, maybe if we all meet in Washington, maybe we can get somewhere on a compromise that can stave off this civil war. Maybe we can do better than Congress. And the product of that convention, which was basically draw the Missouri Compromise line to the Pacific, is a non-starter for the Republicans. They have been conceived on a platform of not expanding slavery into the territories. They have, um, they have uh, been elected on a platform of preventing the expansion of slavery. And so this is just gonna be a complete non-starter for them. Uh, Tyler then goes home to Virginia to, a, to try and lead his state out of the Civil War or into the Civil War and out of the Union. Um, and so Tyler is gonna be one of the most prominent voices in the Virginia Secession Convention, arguing, uh, you know, the majority of the delegates at, to the Virginia Secession election were uh, elected on platforms of staying in the union. Uh, really that body had been elected by its citizens uh, to keep Virginia in the union. Uh, but the sentiment changes after Fort Sumter and Tyler has a much easier time of convincing his fellow delegates to secede. Tyler then, a former president of the United States, uh, will join the Provisional Confederate Congress. And in fact, after the Union defeat at Bull Run, uh, Tyler uh, celebrated but urged an immediate takeover of Washington, D.C. He said Confederate cavalry should uh, seize this opportunity to take over the national capital and try to end the conflict uh, early. Uh, Tyler, of course, will, will die. Um, not long afterwards, uh, the only president to die an enemy of his country. Um, Franklin Pierce, uh, really the, another standout in his opposition to Abraham Lincoln, he traveled the country making speeches, arguing that if um, the South could not be persuaded to stay, that they must be permitted to leave uh, of their own volition. Um, that uh, force was simply not uh, an option, not a moral option, not a constitutionally viable option to uh, keep, to keep uh, the seceding states in the union. Uh, Pierce will also campaign throughout the country for anti-war Democrats. You know, we think, uh, you know, it's been famously observed that war is a continuation of politics by other methods. Uh, but during the Civil War, at least, politics was a continuation of war by other methods. And so the ability of um, Abraham Lincoln to sustain the war effort very much relied on him having uh, sufficient support in Congress and sufficient support among the governors and among uh, state legislatures. And so Franklin Pierce would prove a formidable adversary uh, to his uh, successor. Um, Pierce, of course, will become totally discredited uh, uh, in, the, in July of uh, 1863 he will give a, um, a speech saying the Union war effort has failed, it must be abandoned. We need to vote the Republicans out of office. Uh, a couple of days later, you have uh, Vicksburg and the success at Gettysburg, which will eliminate the CSA's ability to uh, work offensively against the Union. Um, and of course, uh, Pierce will, will spend the rest of his life uh, under a cloud uh, for his uh, position during the Civil War. Um, Buchanan, and, um, Buchanan and Fillmore will turn on Lincoln in 1864. They support McClellan. Uh, they were four square against the Emancipation Proclamation. So, you know, Van Buren dies. I think he undoubtedly would have been very enthusiastically supportive of the Emancipation Proclamation. Fillmore and Buchanan think that Lincoln had unwisely uh, uh, enlarged the, the objectives of the war effort from preserving the Union to preserving the Union and destroying the institution of slavery. Uh, they believed it would make it harder to win the war um, and, and that it was simply, simply an unwise decision. Lincoln, of course, will win in 1864 um, and uh, preside over um, the uh, effective, if not technical, defeat of the Confederate States of America, really setting a new uh, precedent for the presidency. 
where he had these these predecessors who believed um, in compromising and sort of giving in to the most belligerent factions in the country. Uh, Lincoln drew the line on principle on what he had been elected on. And of course, to my mind is uh, not just our greatest president, but our greatest American. And so I know there are probably lots of questions from the audience. Um, you feel free, I think, to type those in the chat box. Um, and then, uh, and then, then those will be asked of me. There's always so many good questions from this group uh, and I look forward to them. But thank you guys all for your kind attention for this um, and giving me the opportunity to come and talk about these former presidents uh, and the civil war that they both caused and tried to prevent. Uh, Chris, while we're waiting for, for questions to come in, I, I'll start with one. Great. Um, in your book, you talk, uh, it's interesting during the war, these ex-presidents were communicating among themselves, often in opposition to Lincoln. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's always so interesting to read the private correspondence of the presidents. You know, you get to know these people you're researching in a way that you don't even know your best friends. You know, I don't get to see my friend's email. I don't know what they talk about with their wives or their best friends um, when I'm not there. Uh, but yeah, you read this correspondence between these uh, presidents, these former presidents, and it's really interesting. So, you know, first they're trying to strategize about how to beat Lincoln in the election, right? All, all, all of these presidents were opposed to the candidacy of Abraham Lincoln. Some supported Douglas, some supported Breckinridge, some didn't say uh, who they wanted, but they all knew that to elect Abraham Lincoln and the Republicans, uh, was tantamount to inviting civil war. And so they didn't want that. There was an attempt to try to lock him out in the electoral college. You know, maybe we can get enough votes and we can come up with a compromise candidate in the electoral college. But of course, Lincoln wins a, a very uh, clean majority uh, of that body. Um, and, and then they differ, you know, then they kind of fall apart. Um, there were, you know, there were people who wrote to them there were people who wrote to them said, you're the former presidents, you guys need to get together. You carry a moral authority you know, that, that um, nobody else has in this country as former presidents. It's such an important role, you know, because the thought is you're done with politics, you've, you've been at the summit, you've been the president for the whole country. And, um, and so, you know, there was an effort by, um, by Pierce to try to coordinate uh, a meeting of the ex-presidents. And I think that just would have been so interesting. I, I, the, I write about it in a chapter called The Meeting That Never Was. And um, um, and so Van Buren kind of sees that, you know what, he goes, the purpose of this meeting is gonna try to, to, to cut Lincoln's knees out. Pierce wants to get us together, maybe to endorse the compromise that came out of um, John Tyler's um, old gentleman's convention maybe, um, you know, endorse um, the Crittenden Compromise, which was a similar compromise that, that came out of uh, Congress. Um, and so Van Buren says, I'm not going to be used for this purpose. And um, he, he manages to scuttle these, this meeting of the former presidents, which would have been just so interesting, but uh, never did come to pass. And so uh, that's really the closest they ever come to working in concert uh, on anything, um, you know, after their attempt to stop Abraham Lincoln. But Lincoln can count on three out of the five, um, you know, after Fort Sumter. Well, yeah, he can count on them, except that after the Emancipation Proclamation, as you pointed yeah. out, they- and Then it falls apart. Yeah. So we've had several questions. So let's, I'll start going through those. Um, so what communications did, once the war was underway, what communications did those former presidents have directly with Lincoln? Okay, so it's interesting. Uh, you know, Millard Fillmore wrote a very long letter to Abraham Lincoln on how to handle a foreign policy crisis. So you have um, the, 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 the Confederate States purports to send some diplomats to the United Kingdom to try to bring them into the war. The ship that they're on is boarded by uh, the Union Navy and it causes this international incident because uh, UK says, wait a minute, these are diplomats being sent to the UK and you've, you've wrongfully boarded the ship and taken these diplomats. And so it's the closest that the UK really comes to entering the war and the UK coming in on the side of the Confederate States of America would have been 
uh, tantamount to the South winning the Civil War. I mean, if you think about the success of the Union blockade and the indispensable aspect of the Union blockade, well, you put the Union blockade up against the world's biggest Navy and you start to have real problems. Also, that's the number one variable in every successful rebellion is whether you have foreign intervention. So in the American Revolution, that of course is um, the limitless credit and military support of France, which you know, bankrupts the country. Um, but you know, they, they, they managed to teach their arch rival Britain a lesson in that theater in the process. So um, Fillmore writes a really long letter to, to, to Lincoln that Lincoln uncharacteristically never responds to, or at least we've never found a response. Uh, at one point, uh, William Seward um, accuses Franklin Pierce of being a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle, which is a Southern terrorist organization. And uh, you know, Pierce uh, gets in a public, he writes to him, but it becomes a public dispute. And uh, Seward is forced to apologize to Pierce because he ultimately doesn't have any, any proof of this. And so I think that's really the closest you will get uh, to the former presidents corresponding with Abraham Lincoln. Um, you know, they certainly do a lot for and against him, but in terms of actually communicating with him at that point, uh, that's the extent of it. So at, at the time of the uh, 1864 election, I think uh, Fillmore Buchanan and, um, uh, and Pierce are still a lot living. Did they support McClellan in 1864? Yes, they all supported McClellan. Um, so yeah, Fillmore and uh, Buchanan and Pierce, uh, because Fillmore and, and Buchanan um, abandoned Lincoln over the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, because they remember their objective is, is reunification of the union. And so, you know, McClellan's going to try to get a negotiated peace, which he probably could have done successfully, um, or at least possibly could have done successfully. So that was more in line with, with what they were hoping for. They wanted the war to end. Did they just oppose the Emancipation Proclamation as a tactical matter, or, or did they also oppose the 13th Amendment? Oh, that's so interesting. So, um, you know, I, ha I wonder, it's such a good question. You know, they don't publicly come out for or against the 13th Amendment. Um, and, and so I, I, think, I think Fillmore, you know, Fillmore actually raised funds to allow um, slaves to buy their freedom. Personally, this is a guy who's really strongly opposed to slavery. Uh, I think Buchanan um, may be somewhat indifferent, right, to the institution. Um, but, but Fillmore was actually really anti-slavery. Um, and so I think Pierce was, Pierce was certainly against the 13th Amendment. Um, he saw it as a deprivation of property um, and unnecessarily antagonistic. Pierce thought that about the gag rule. There was, ne Pier Pierce never met an anti-slavery measure he didn't like. Pierce simply couldn't understand why people were abolitionists, why people opposed slavery. There were no measures throughout Franklin Pierce's career that, that I'm aware of that he ever supported uh, to try to limit uh, um, the reach and power of slavery. Um, so no, it's not just a tactic. I think it was like, wh what are you doing? You're, you're prolonging the war and uh, you're doing it, you know, this is, this is exceeding your mandate. Uh, we have a question you put on your, your speculators hat here. Okay, uh, I if, like that. If Lincoln had lost the election with a kind of, with the question of slavery been just put off for four more years, I mean, what, what do you see happening? Because as you know, all his predecessors were against him, certainly. Yeah, so I think slavery continues in the United States indefinitely. You know, there's a, I got a question and I'll, I'll, I'll use this one to answer two questions. There's a question on whether slavery was still legal in Brazil at, at, at the time um, that it was, so the time that those confederados I was talking about earlier um, resettled and so yes, Brazil, uh, slavery remains um, legal in Brazil and thriving in Brazil. Uh, close to the end of the 19th century. And so if, um, you know, there's no reason that that wouldn't have been true in the United States. And people would have had this memory of this civil war uh, that was so horrible uh, and so bloody um, that they would have said, hey, you know, let's not revisit that slavery issue. And so really when you think about, you know, slavery as uh, Mississippi called it in its secession declaration, the greatest material interest in the world, right? The most valuable, institution in the world, more valuable than all the, the factories and locomotives and industrial might of the North. Um, 
you know, name another country that abolished its, its, its largest industry. And so I think you would have had uh, slavery uh, perpetually, you know, well into the end of the 19th century, maybe even into the 20th century in the United States. It, it, even if McClellan had been successful in um, getting the South to a negotiated surrender, sort of status quo antebellum, which is probably what he would have been seeking. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really, uh, you cannot overstate enough the importance of Abraham Lincoln winning in 1864. Um, did any of the former presidents support the Critten Crittenden Compromise? Maybe you can talk a little bit about the compromise. Yeah, sure. I mean, the Crittenden Compromise, he's really just trying to, to draw, you know, Crittenden sort of emerges uh, in, in, you know, Henry Clay's role, the senator from Kentucky, a border state, trying to bring both sides of the country together. Um, and so it's really just about taking that, you know, hey, we tried in the Missouri Compromise, let's just take that Missouri Compromise line and extend it and call it a day. Um, and uh, uh, of course, you know, that would have made sense to, very much made sense to, to Fillmore. Um, I think Buchanan would have been all for that. I think Pierce wouldn't have understood why we would ever mark off a part of the country where slavery couldn't exist. Really, truly um, didn't understand why, why, why abolitionists or people opposed to slavery in any way should get anything. Um, but I don't see Van Buren supporting the Crittenden Compromise because Van Buren had run for president on the free, uh, free soil. He was a free soil candidate in 1848. So really the, the most stridently anti-slavery party had Van Buren as their nominee for president. So I think he would have opposed it. The rest would have supported it. Unfortunately for them, Abraham Lincoln was in the White House and he was not about uh, to retreat an inch from, from the central plank of the Republican party, which was no, no spread of slavery into the territories. Um, we have a couple of questions here at the end. And if there are more questions, please uh, put them in. That kind of run together. Um, so once the war was over, for the, the, I forget, there was still either two or three of these ex-presidents still alive. Wow. Did, did they express any opinion about whether Lincoln was ultimately correct in his policy? And did they take any positions you know, in, the, in the battles between Andrew Johnson and, and Congress over Reconstruction? You know, that's interesting. It's such a great question. Um, so I will say, you know, they sort of, after the Civil War is done, they, 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 these former presidents do tend to assume the previous rules of the post-presidency, which were you're on the sidelines, you're out of politics, um, you stay out of it. And so you're really not going to hear much from these former presidents uh, during Johnson's tenure after, after the Civil War. Um, but there's never any obvious, uh, certainly not from Franklin Pierce, um, Buchanan argued in his memoirs that Abraham Lincoln had simply followed his policies. And without, you know, with, with the conspicuous exception of Lincoln's opposition to slavery um, in the form of the Emancipation Proclamation, the Confiscation Acts, uh, the 13th Amendment, um, with, the, with, with those conspicuous exceptions, Buchanan said, hey, I laid out the blueprint for Abraham Lincoln with the Star of the West, reinforcing Fort Sumter, he really just ran my playbook. And so he, he saw Lincoln's triumph as his triumph. Um, but, you know, nothing, nothing from Fillmore about, um, you know, Lincoln ultimately being correct on, on slavery. But I, I think, I think he probably, I think he probably in his heart felt that Lincoln was because Fillmore had no love for slavery. He, he, he would have loved to have seen it disappear. I think he just thought the Emancipation Proclamation was a miscalculation that could lead to permanent disunion. Well, along those lines, uh, uh, you mentioned that you thought Fillmore was actually a pretty good president. And I actually, uh, I came away from your book with a much better impression of Fillmore than I had before. Yeah. Um, as you went through researches, researching these five ex-presidents, did, uh, did you start with that opinion on Fillmore or how did your opinions change of the, of, on these ex-presidents or, or did they as you went through your Yeah, research? that's so interesting. So first of all, you know, we, we look back on these people as kind of a joke. And the truth of the matter is, you know, these were serious people who uh, held many of the most important jobs in the United States uh, with, uh, often with the support and encouragement of their peers and uh, with, with the, you know, the people who voted for them. 
And so, um, you know, I tried to approach it, you know, in a way with, with the respect for, for the people who uh, elevated these men, you know, and said, okay, and these, these were serious people. And, um, you know, they get dismissed as, as unimportant presidents. You know, I mean, John Tyler opened up China to trade. Was that a pretty important decision with long lasting ramifications, right? But it's things, things we don't think about. Um, and John Tyler, um, you know, while his principles were not my principles, he was a man who was consistent and stuck to his principles throughout his, his life, you know, when uh, vetoing, um, you know, the National Bank, even though it got him kicked out of the Whig party. Uh, he's the only president to be kicked out of his own political party. Um, but he thought that the National Bank bill that came out of Congress exceeded Congress's mandate uh, uh, to adopt a, a national bank. And so, um, so he vetoed it and got kicked out of his own party for it. Um, and so these were, were men of, of great principle, even when their principles were not my principles. Um, Millard Fillmore, I think, sort of gets dismissed as a joke because he's got a funny sounding name. But he's one of the most important presidents in history. Um, Zachary, if Zachary Taylor had lived, we would have gotten the Civil War in 1850. And it may not have, um, you know, South Carolina may not have been joined by as many uh, Southern states as it ultimately was in the 1860 secession crisis. But Taylor invited Ca California to come into the Union uh, with no offsets for the South, which was unheard of. Um, so there's going to be this new uh, free state, two new free state senators, um, and he's willing to, to put down any agitation at the head of the military. Now, Taylor, as a uh, Southerner, as a, a massive slaveholder, but also as the most popular man among the military for his leadership in the Mexican-American War, his long career in the army, um, probably would have successfully put down whatever had happened, uh, you know, any kind of uprising in short order. And I think that actually might have been our best bet to avoid the Civil War. If it had been triggered in 1850, you've got a Southern slaveholder leading the Union, who is also extremely popular with the army. Um, he probably succeeds very quickly in putting down the rebellion and future would-be rebels probably think twice um, when they don't get their way down the line. But of course, that doesn't come to pass. Fillmore replaces him and Fillmore supports these compromises that do keep the country intact throughout the 1850s. Um, they called it a final settlement, which is always asking for trouble whenever you brand something as a final settlement, a final disposition of the country's animosities. But they, that 18, those 1850s are a really critical period that allow uh, the Northern states to acquire the manufacturing and population advantages that make the Civil War more or less, uh, at least a military fait accompli from the moment it starts. Um, question here is, were there plans to prosecute Tyler had he survived the war? And sort of also, was there much public reaction in the North to Tyler's role at the time? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, Tyler was seen as a traitor to the United States. Um, you know, in 1862, I believe Tyler dies in 1862. He dies relatively early in the war. Um, you know, we're not thinking that far ahead, right? 1862 is the year of, year of uh, uh, unprecedented calamity for the Union forces. Uh, if there are people thinking about, you know, who they're going to prosecute at the end of this, they are thinking multiple steps ahead and being very optimistic at that point. Um, so, um, you know, even, even in 1865, as the war is coming to an end, we don't know what we want to do with the leadership of the Confederacy. You know, Abraham Lincoln expresses private hopes that uh, Jefferson Davis can make it to Europe or make it out of the country uh, along with his leadership to, to sort of spare him from making what will be a very controversial decision in either regard. Um, and so nobody had thought that far ahead for Tyler yet. Um, but I think as, a, as an ordinary member of the Confederate Congress, I think he probably would have escaped any sort of prosecution, uh, but he certainly um, did not escape uh, ill fame in the North. And um, honestly, I think he probably gets off too easy today, right? As a former president, um, you know, who died an enemy of his country. Um, so did, did, your, did your opinion of Lincoln change at all? 
Ah, that's so interesting. Um, you know, Lincoln was probably the one president I had a pretty good handle on before I undertook this book because I'd already written um, you know, the book about his congressional years. And so I already had a feeling and he was probably the president I just read the most about. So I already had a feeling for his integrity and his statesmanship and, and, and um, you know, his incredible personal qualities. Um, it, it is interesting to sort of see his life juxtaposed with these other presidents because he is someone who wanted to be president as much as any of them. But in this antebellum era, you know, everyone from Man Van Buren, Tyler, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, all experience incredible success in politics that eludes Lincoln uh, for most of his career up until the day he's elected president, or at least nominated by the Republican Party. Um, and so I think, you know, it really, it really makes his, his life story even that much more inspirational next to uh, that of his, his predecessors who were holding all kinds of offices and really calling the shots in the antebellum era. Well, I think we've come to the end of our questions. That's really a kind of a good note to, to end on. I want to thank you, Chris, on behalf of everyone. Uh, this is a great presentation and discussion. Well, thank you for having me. And if I could, I'd love Thanks, to Chris. encourage everyone to visit my website at christerosebooks.com. Um, I'll actually type it out for you guys. Okay. Uh, christerosebooks.com. There's also um, a leather bound gold leaf edition of this book, The President's War, that has been issued by uh, Griffin Editions. And so I'd be sorely remiss uh, if I didn't let you guys know about it. I've provided a link on my website, um, but this is it uh, right here. I was very grateful to this company you know, anytime someone wants to print your words in, in leather bound and in, in gold leaf, um, it's always a, a great honor. And so I'd be sorely remiss if I didn't tell you guys about that. But please reach out to me, get in touch with me, uh, christrosebooks.com. And thank you for having me tonight. And let's do this again in person next I would time. also like to plug uh, Chris's book on the, the Fighting Bunch, which I thought was fantastic, Chris. Thank you, John, very much. Yeah, The Fighting Bunch, my new one. I was real shocked when I started reading it when it said of the Battle of Athens. Yeah, it's a, it's a southern rebellion that actually succeeded. It was very appropriate for the times. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you guys for having me very Thank much. Thank you. Very worth reading, guys. And we'll see everybody on April 20th for our next speaker. Thank you. Okay. Night. Night.